All right, Psalm 149. Let's read the entire psalm. Again, just uh, not very many verses, I think nine verses. And we will look at our third lesson uh, that we've entitled, The Lord Takes Pleasure in His People, which is out of verse number four. It says, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and His praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in Him that made Him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their King. Let them praise His name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto Him with the timbrel and harp for or because the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. The awareness that God has done such a work that he is able to take pleasure and delight in us uh, should cause us, should praise, uh, cause praise to bubble over, to sound forth from the saints. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute judgment upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. So the Lord takes pleasure in his people. If we are part of God's family, if we are uh, that which is considered to be God's People, if we're conscious of him being pleased with us, like it says in verse 4, then it will prompt pl- uh, praise. That's a tongue twister there. It will prompt praise in our mouth, as the psalm says, and there will be a desire to please him, right? If, if we realize that God has done such a work that he is pleased with us, the response of this child of God is, I want to do those things that are pleasing to you, God, right? Uh, look at Romans 6, Romans chapter 6. We, we just read in our psalm here that God will beautify the meek with salvation. And listen, what are you saved from, church? You say, well, I'm saved from sin, right? Well, listen to what Romans 6 says. If that is true, if we are saved from sin and death, then you won't want to live in that anymore, right? And Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1 says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We've got churches today that don't have any problem rejoicing in God's pleasure, right? They see themselves as having the pleasure of God and they rejoice in that. But you know what? They don't really have the pleasure of God. And you know how I know that? Because they're not living lives that, that, that confess that they want to be pleasing to God. They're rejoicing in the fact that God is pleased with them, but they aren't doing the things that are pleasing to him. Look at 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter number 3. Somebody, maybe maybe Brother Bobby mentioned this last week, I can't remember, but uh, read that to us in, in Ephesians 2 that we're so familiar with. Again, Grace by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of good works, lest any should boast, but it is unto good works. And in 1 John chapter number 3, uh, my marker was uh, confusing me there. Hang on just a minute. I'll catch up with you. First John chapter number 3, listen to this. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. We're considering that thought that the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He takes pleasure in his family. He takes pleasure in those that he has called his sons. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know what we're heading towards. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, for we shall see him as he is. Listen to verse number three. And how many men? Every man that hath this hope in himself, what will he without fail do? He purifieth himself even as he is pure. Those that really truly have the pleasure of God, they delight to do those things in which God takes pleasure. Jesus said, I do always those things that please my father. That is the pattern of those that are part of his family. That is the pattern of his sons. That is the pattern of those that take that, that the Lord takes pleasure in. And so I, I wanted us to see that, and I wanted us to acknowledge that we've got many places of religion where they talk about having the pleasure of God, and there's great rejoicing in that, but there's none of this follow-up that should go right along with that. And I want to encourage you, just because you see that error there, 
Don't let that rob us of enjoying that which belongs to the true children of God. We ought to rejoice in the fact that God takes pleasure in his people. Now, um, when you read the first part of this psalm here, like I said, you, when you read that verse about the Lord takes pleasure in his people, that is a unique expression for the children of God. So if you're outside of Christ, you don't find yourself there. But as this psalm continues on, guess what? You're either at the beginning of this psalm or you're at the end. You're somewhere in this psalm. Okay, and so I want to look at that as we continue on a little further this morning. It may be hard, you know, we can read the first part of that psalm and it's easy for us to identify with that. I can see how that applies to me personally as a child of God. And, and, and that's pretty easy to make that personal applica application. But once you get to verse number six, let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Okay, I can get in on that and then and a two-edged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, you know, can we still get it on that personally? Does that have personal application to me? We might read that and think, well, that must be Old, Old Testament application then. You know, when Israel was warring and fighting and they were conquering kingdoms and those sorts of things, you know, uh, we could see where this would fit in to, to be a psalm of David because David was a man of war and he fought and, and they conquered their enemies. But let's look at Jude. Jude, verse number 14. Jude 14. What about this taking vengeance? What, this, what about this executing judgment? To execute the judgment written, our psalm said, this honor have all his saints. Look, into, look to Jude, verse number 14. This section here is talking about those that are spots in your feast of charity. Verse number 12 those that have run uh, greedily after the heir of Balaam uh, for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory, it says in verse number 11, uh, concerning these, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh. But is it just the Lord? Who's with them? Saints. How many saints? Not 10,000. Notice that there's an S on the end of that word, right? Ten thousands of his saints. When you look it up in, in Strong's, it says uh, 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 th that this can mean an innumerable amount, right? Ten thousand. He's coming with ten thousands of his saints to do what, does the next verse say? Execute to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The people of the Lord, those that are his people, that are his family, the saints, they are to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints, it says in Psalm 149 and verse 4. And here we find it. It's not, it's not just an Old Testament thought. We find it here in the New Testament as well. That the Lord is coming to execute judgment. And he comes with the multitude of his saints to execute judgment upon these. Um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians 6. This is you, church, that, he, that he's talking about here. Um, uh, verse, chapter number 6 and verse number 1 of, of 1 Corinthians. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, right? Do you know you were part of that? The saints shall judge the world. I, I didn't look this verse up, but I just thought about it. Remember when he's speaking to the disciples, he talked about those that follow him, uh, that, that he, will, he will place them upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember that? Puts them in a place of judgment, he says, those that follow after him. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? This honor have all his saints. That's what Psalm 149 says. And so how will we do this? 
How are we judging? How are we executing vengeance upon this world? How does that happen? Well, the psalm says that we do it with a two-edged sword in our hand. And I think we're probably familiar enough with that phrase there that we know exactly what that's referring to, right? What does Hebrews 4 tell us that that two-edged sword is? The Word of God, right? The Word of God. That's Hebrews 4, 12. This two-edged sword that they go forth with, executing judgment, executing vengeance and accomplishing judgment. Look at John chapter number 12. This is exactly how Christ says it works as he speaks of the judgment that he would accomplish. Look at it. Listen to John chapter number 12. And John 12 and verse number 46 I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my what? My words, and believe not, I judge him not. What's going to judge that man? For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not, there it is again, my words hath one that judgeth him. What is it? The word. Right? The word that I have spoken, the two-edged sword that the saints of God are carrying into the world, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself. Even Jesus, the Son of God, said, this, didn't, this isn't just me. These are the words of who? My Father. What word are we carrying forth? It's not my words. If it's just my word, well, we can argue back and forth, and maybe your opinion's as good as mine. It's not just my word I'm giving you, right? It is the word of God. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. It is the word of God that we carry forth. It is the word of God that will judge them. We're familiar with it. I, I, I like to read this verse a lot. Uh, we read it in general here in, in this congregation. But in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, it says it's talking about them that perished because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And when you listen to Jesus praying in John 17, he says, Father, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at Jeremiah chapter 36. In Jeremiah 36. In Jeremiah 36, the word of God comes to Jeremiah. Now, I want you to listen to the way that this is phrased here as God is speaking to his prophet. In Jeremiah 36, beginning in verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. That was amazing to me because this king stands out above all the other kings of Judah. God said there wasn't a king like him before him nor one of the kings of judah that were after him that were like him in walking in, in obedience to god and yet he has this son Jeho jehoiakim that god uh, begins to speak to uh, his prophet jeremiah in his days. so the son of josiah king of judah that this word came unto jeremiah from the lord saying take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, um, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Now, we haven't shifted language, and, and now we're talking, Jeremiah's talking. God's still talking here. God's still talking to his prophet. And listen to what he says in verse number 3. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So God is sending forth his word, and man is going to have a responsibility as he hears that word, to receive it and to repent of his sin. A word of judgment that he's given to the prophet. God says, God uses this language here. You figure it out, right? <laughs> God uses the language. It may be, it makes me think over there in Acts chapter 17 where it says, God has set the times and the bounds of their habitation to what end? That they might seek the Lord and know him though he be not far from all of them. And so God says, I'm sending my word, and with that word comes a responsibility. And so what's going to happen if they deny that word? Judgment, right? This word is going to judge them. 
God's giving a word, that a word that ought to bring man to repent of his iniquity and sin. God is warning in his long suffering of the judgment that is to come. But what's going to happen? He refuses to hear it. You guys remember this king here. What does this king end up doing? Does anybody know as the chapter continues on? This is the guy that cuts it up, right, and throws it in the fire. Let's, let's see that. Let's read on down a little bit further. Um, so a word given that they might repent, uh, that they might recognize the judgment and repent of their sin, of their iniquity. In verse 23, and it came to pass that when Jehudi uh, had read three or four leaves, he, that is the king, Jehoiakim, cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were, not only was the king in on this, but those that were with him were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. And listen, I want to tell you something this morning. You can deny the words that the preacher is preaching, but listen, if it's the word of God, you can cut it up and you can cast it in the fire. That doesn't make it any less true. And you're still going to face God, given an account of the truth that God gave you. As the saints of God carry the word of God into the world, it is a blessing and rejoicing for those that knew, know the Lord, those that are saved through that word. But it is, an, it is an act of vengeance and an act of judgment upon those that reject the truth. And so this wicked king cuts it up and he throws it into the fire. And what happens beginning in verse number 30? Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David and his dead body shall be cast out in the day of day to the heat and in the night to the frost. This is the word that God speaks against Jeho Jehoiakim through the prophet. And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearkened not. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah how many words of what had been written before? All the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And you know what? God said, okay, and I'm going to add more to it. And there were added besides unto them many like words. Remember that text in the New Testament that says that, that it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to have turned from it. It got even worse, right? God added even more words to this word of judgment that he was already given. Whose fault was that? Who was at fault in that? Was God merciful and kind and given his word of judgment? Was God right in taking vengeance and pronouncing further judgment? He rejected the word of God. And guys, I'm going to just keep laboring in that until I, I, I'm blue in the face, right? Because I want us to understand that when we stand before God, there's no one to blame but us if we refuse the word of God. Man is inexcusable. Jehoiakim was inexcusable, and the judgment was even worse because of rejecting that word. He threw it in the fire, he burned it, but let me tell you something. Heaven and earth will pass away, but what does God say will not? My words shall not pass away, right? So when you want to praise this God because of his mercy, when you're among his people in the beginning of this psalm and you want to praise God because of his mercy, you will declare him to the world around you. You can't help that, right? The praise of God overflows from your mouth. And as the word of God goes forth from his church, they are executing judgment. They are, they're executing vengeance. And they're bringing judgment in the world because of the world that will reject that word. The result will be that there is not only the first half of the psalm, but there is another result to that, and that is the second half of the psalm. You're in one or the other part of this psalm, okay? Everybody here today is in one or the other part of that psalm. This psalm, uh, it, 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 the whole world falls in one of those two categories listed in this psalm. And so this psalm sets forth 
uh, part of that basis for our evangelism. The reason that we declare the word of God is because our hearts are overflowing with praise. We see that at the beginning. Sing, right? Declare. Declare these things. Sing, sing and testify of those things because you recognize what God has done, the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts. But there's something else that also prompts evangelism, that prompts us to declare the word of God. And what is that according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Because it's because we not only understand the first part of the psalm, but it's because we also understand the second part of the psalm. Look, listen to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 11. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 11, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So the awareness that this, this not just the first part of this psalm that exists, but there's a second part of that also prompts us to declare the word of God to men and to warn men. But we, because we recognize that this word is going to have a twofold effect in this world. I want to encourage you, church, whatever the outcome is. God's people are overcomers, right? Whatever the outcome is with the word of God, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are taking over. The, the kingdom of God is advancing, right? Whether it be a day in which you see people responding to the gospel uh, as you would have them to in true repentance or a day which we're increasingly seeing in our land where they reject the gospel and they, they will not heed the warnings that are listed. But in either case, God's kingdom is advancing and we are conquering. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Look at Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation 12 and verse number, around verse number 11. Revelation 12 and verse number 11, speaking of those, uh, verse 10 talks about the accuser of our brethren who was cast down, Satan being cast out, which accused them before our God day and night. And how did these brethren overcome? What's going to be the process of our, of our overcoming in this world? And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. First of all, it's not by works of righteousness that I have done, right? But according to his mercy, he saved me. The blood of the lamb and also what? The By the word of their testimony, right? They go forth conquering and to conquer through the word of their testimony as they follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. And they loved not their lives unto death. So how is it our psalm says that we bind and take vengeance? How is that? Look at Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter, chapter number 18. Let's look at another verse with that thought. How is it that we bind? The, the psalm said uh, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Listen to Matthew 18 and verse number 15. Moreover, if thy brethren shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Listen, it's a big deal to have the word of God presented to you. Whatever vessel that comes through. And the next verse is going to show that very clearly. Listen to what it says in the next verse. Verily I say unto you, to the church, the Lord says, Whatsoever ye shall bind. There's our word that we found over there in Psalm 149. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. How are we binding and loosing? Through the declaration of the word of God. As we go forth with that two-edged sword in our hand, there is a binding and there is also a loosing that is accomplished. Look at John chapter 20. Man, we're out of time. John chapter 20. In John 20, 
around verse number 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so I send it. So send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Does that mean we have some sort of mystical power to, to forgive or to uh, retain sins? No. It's talking about that which is accomplished as we, as the church goes forth with the word of God. The result will be there will be those that are forgiven. The other result is that there will be those that are, will be eternally bound because they reject that word that the church delivers to them. You're going to have to deal with that word. You're going to have to answer for that word. You can cut it up and throw it in the fire. You can do all the things that men do today to try to put it out of their minds and ignore it and forget about it. You can fight against it. You can put it down. You can try to put the light out, but you will answer to God for that word that he has given one day. <laughs>